This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, welcome everyone to long table number 171. Uh, we have Jeff Shevlin today uh, who goes as the, the so-called guy. That doesn't mean he's a so-called guy, but uh, as you'll learn today, there's, there's a, a very explicit meaning to that. Uh, um, he has, Jeff has a background in IT. He's been a numismatist since the 80s. Um, he has been the executive director of the American Numismatic Association. Um, for a while, he was the uh, special projects director for the Northwest Territorial Mint, focusing on MAKO, which is uh, spe uh, special to us at the ANS because, as many of you know, in 2018, the ANS purchased the MAKO archive. So Jeff has actually had uh, some hand in that before it came to us. Uh, along with Bill Hyder, who I believe is on the call today, um, uh, has uh, written a handful of books on so-called dollars, uh, one in 2019 uh, called The So-Called Dollars from the Pacific Coast Expositions, and a very recent book uh, published in 2023, uh, So-Called Dollars Volume 1, which focuses on all of the U.S. expositions. Um, and he is also the overseer of the so-called dollar collectors website, which I uh, am a frequent uh, visitor to. So I'm not going to get too much into what so-called dollars are because that is the topic of today's long table. So please, Jeff, I hand it off to you. Well, thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm, I think what we'll probably do is uh, if you have any questions, if it's something really important, you can go ahead and add it, but it might be best if you just held it to the end. I'd be glad to answer any questions and um, at that time. So uh, as Jesse said, uh, my name is Jeff Shevlin. I've been a collector of so-called dollars since the mid to latter 1980s. Part of that, I was a collector of most of the U.S. Mint series uh, from pennies up through dollars. I collected quite a few of them. but um, I was attending, I lived, in, I lived in Sacramento at the time, which I, where I currently live in Sacramento, California. I was attending a Sacramento Valley Coin Club. And at that coin club, as many coin clubs do, they had a, a little auction. I ended up buying a medal at that auction that I had no idea what it was. It had Liberty Bell on one side. And I saw And within a few years, my interest from coins waned and I started my interest in these historical metals grew and within three to year, three years or so I transitioned from being a numismatist that collected coins to a numismatist that collected historical metals and specifically so called dollars. So a so called dollar is uh, a metal that's about between 33 and 45 millimeters. They're, and they're a struck to commemorate events in United States history. They're not store cards, they're not advertising cards. Uh, religious medals are not so-called dollars. Um, awarded medals are not. So when you kind of take away all those things that are not so-called dollars, you're left with a group of metals, approximately the size of a silver dollar, that are just commemorative in nature. The first standard reference book for these medals was published by Hibbler and Kappen in 1963. And, um, I, and it was reprinted in 2008. And Bill Hyder and I, my co Bill Hyder is a very good friend of mine, and we have formed a partnership where we've been uh, giving presentations and writing books and articles on, on these medals. And I attend the 10 to 20 largest coin shows in the country. Bill often attends them with me, uh, just buying and selling these metals. So um, I'm going to just, this is the latest book that Bill and I just authored. It is called uh, So Called Dollars Volume One United States Expositions. Now, just to give you a quick overview of our publishing strategy, we believe that. For people to develop an interest in this series or in anything related to numismatics, they need to have a little bit, they need to understand the stories, the background of what metals or coins, if, if the case may be, 
interesting. So our first several books that we wrote were storybooks. Um, they talked about the different people, uh, events, things that happened, uh, what, what these medals commemorate, why they commemorate them, the economics, the politics, the stories behind them. The first several books we wrote were storybooks so people would under, know the stories related to these medals and understand why they are interesting to collect. And then this is our latest book and this is a reference book. So it's not quite a story book. We have incorporated hundreds of small stories into this book as we cataloged each individual medal. But it's not, um, it's not a story book like our previous book was so-called Dollars from the Pacific Coast Expositions. There are eight expositions held on the Pacific Coast and we have about 10 to 20 pages of historical information associated with each one of those expositions. And then we cataloged all the medals from those expositions. Well, this one catalogs 67 expositions. Every exposition held in the United States which struck a historical medal, so-called dollar size for them. In the previous book by Hibbler and Kappen, they cataloged about 20 expositions. So this is much more comprehensive. There's hundreds of medals that were never cataloged before, never published. Using the uh, Lewis and Clark Exposition, the previous reference book, they cataloged four different medals. And Bill's book and mine, we cataloged over 20. As a forward by Ken Brissett, who's a good friend of mine, we printed a thousand books. We did a hundred deluxe editions, which we sold for $149.95, and those are sold out. The regular edition sells for $59.95. And uh, we printed this book last year. We have a few hundred left. We've sold about 700 of them so far, 750 or so. It's 270 pages. It's full color, top quality. And we've also created for this book a new numbering system. Part of the problem with the current reference book or the previous reference book by Hibbler and Kappen is that the numbering system was broken. It was obsolete. And there was really no way to add new metals that needed to be cataloged into, a, into it in any, um, without just totally messing everything up. So it was just kind of a broken system. So we've come up with, one of the first things we needed to come up with was an, a new numbering system that would not become obsolete and would not break. So basically in this book, we introduced that, op, that numbering system which has a unique number for each exposition or a group of small expositions. Within that exposition, each medal is sequentially numbered, starting with the official exposition medal as number one. So if there's like 30, this is using this as an example, this is the California Midwinter Exposition, which is exposition number seven. SH stands for Shevlin and Hyder. And seven represents the, um, California Midwinter Exposition. And there was about 30 different medals from that exposition. So they numbered 7 1 through 7 30. 7 1, this is the official medal. And um, it was struck by United States at that exposition. And then the digits following that, in this case, we have the letters GP, which stands for gold plated. And we have uh, abbreviations for the different compositions gold, silver, copper, brass, or whatever they may be. For so called dollars, there's probably about 20 to 30 different compositions those metals are struck in. And on occasion, we have small varieties. So we might have instead of 7 1, it could be like a 7 1.1 or 1.2. If there are varieties that are similar, but they didn't warrant a unique number for them. So this numbering system will can be expanded and grow and will never become obsolete. You'll always be able to group together metals from any exposition, any exposition as in the future, new additional metals become discovered that were not previously cataloged. So expositions were a big part of how our country was developed. Um, for example, the 1893 Columbian Exposition was held in Chicago. At that time, there were 800,000 people lived in Chicago and 27 and a half million people traveled to be a part of the exposition. And these expositions covered large areas with 
hundreds of buildings in many cases. So you really couldn't go to uh, see everything in a day, even in a week. People would stay there for weeks or sometimes several weeks just to see the different ex exhibits that were at these expositions. And if you can imagine what happened in Chicago when 27 and a half million people came there, if you owned any type of business, you were probably did more business that year than you probably did in the previous 10 years. So the different communities would lobby the federal government to have the rights to host these expositions in their communities because of the positive economic impact it would have on their communities. <clears throat> so the first exposition that was held in the United States is the 1853 New York Crystal Palace Exposition. There are two medals that were struck. And this is actually the first one of the pages of our book for that exposition. Um, what we have done is uh, for each exposition, we have a one page introduction. In some cases, a little bit more than that, but typically a one page introduction that talks about the exposition. And then we have, in this case, there are two medals for the exposition, and both those are cataloged below on the same page here. And for each one of these medals, we have uh, nice, high quality photos of them. Uh, we have the numbering, and the number system for And the first medal is struck with top white metal. So uh, those are the three compositions that metal is known in. We have uh, eight sizes. And the reference number on the right hand column is the current HK number. Uh, as new, so that's the metal that was not previously cataloged. So this is the official metal uh, engraved by William Barber for the 1876 Centennial Exposition was held in Philadelphia on the 100th anniversary of our independence. And I'll just kind of go over with you why this particular metal, and the same thing could be said about every one of these metals, the symbolism on each one of these medals um, is, you know, represents something of a story that needs, to, you know, that the medal is trying to tell. And not only does the medal tell a story, but if you were to take the time to research who struck it, why they struck it, where it was struck, you could probably write a book on any one of these medals if you were so inclined. And Bill Heider and I actually did that on one of these medals that we'll get to a little bit later. But in this case, uh, the message the United States was giving to the rest of the world was that uh, on the, you see uh, a female and she's in a reclining position, but she's standing up and rising. And above her, the stars and rays represent glory. So the message here is the United States can be rising up to be recognized as a world power. Uh, prior to this time, most of Europe still considered the United States to be a third world country. So the message that the United States is giving is that we are no longer going to be considered a third world country. Normally in heraldry, you have like an olive branch in your right hand, which means I prefer peace, a sword in your left hand, which means I will defend myself. Well, in this case, liberty is holding the sword in her right hand, which the message is that the United States is going to be rising up to be recognized as a world power. Don't tread on us. So from the Centennial Exposition and all these expositions of so many new metals that have never been cataloged before, so I'm just giving you a little, just a little flavor here of some of the information that is published in our book that is never published before. And this is a, a pairing of metals by, by Soli. Your voice is going in and out. I can't hear it. I'm sorry. Okay, let me try to be more focused. Thank you. So George Soli was an engraver that worked for the United States Mint. And these are uh, one of the, in the center at the bottom is called a Soli's star reverse die. And that die is paired with five other obverse dies that were engraved by George Soli. 
So this is just kind of a representation of the different interesting medals that were engraved by George Sully on the left is a large bust of George Washington. Then there's a, a small independence hall. Then we have a seated liberty, a seated design up above it, the American colonies to the right and the centennial fountain. And I could talk about each one of these, but I'm gonna just briefly talk about the American colonies. And um, that's what it says in the legend above the medal. When you view that medal, what you see is you see in the center, there's an officer, a soldier officer standing, giving directions, pointing to the to the side, and you see a uh, an, uh, a soldier holding a rifle. On the opposite side, to the left of the medal, you see a farmer. So basically, what this message, the message this medal is giving, is that George Washington was able to transform the Revolutionary uh, Army from a bunch of farmers into soldiers that were able to successfully be, beat the most um, significant army in the world at that time, um, you know, the British. So this is the official medal from the Columbian Exposition. This medal was engraved by George Morgan. The obverse has the administration building and the reverse has a legend about uh, the exposition that was held there. And uh, there's a little micro M on uh, edifice, below the edifice to the right of it. You may not be able to see it. I don't know if my mouse is moving, but right here is a little M. And it's like the M that is on the um, reverse of the Morgan dollar. The next medal here is the uh, 1920 Wilson dollar. This medal was engraved by George, also engraved by George Morgan in 1920. And it was the first medal that was struck at the Manila Mint. And uh, the United States government installed minting equipment in Manila so they'd be able to strike their own coinage. Prior to that, we were striking the coinage for the Filipinos in, in Filipino in. Um, at the San Francisco Mint. So this, uh, the United States government trained the mint, the Filipino em employees how to operate the mint. And uh, Wilson was a president at that time. The verse shows a young child representing the Philippines with a mint in front of him and he's pouring uh, planchets into the mint. And uh, we're kind of teaching them how to strike their own coinage. This medal was also struck in silver and copper. And for example, one of the interesting stories associated with this particular medal is that during World War II, the, the uh, Japanese invaded the Philippines. And sometime before that, the United States realized that they were gonna lose that territory. So they were um, evacuating and all the, uh, all the important people were, you know, getting getting off, you know, evacuating uh, before the Japanese invaded, and they were smuggling out as much of the gold and silver coinage as they could, but a significant amount of it they were not able to get out prior to the invasion, so they ended up dumping it into the Manila Bay, in the in the deepest part of the Manila Bay, which is about 150 feet deep. So there were no gold coinage dumped there, but there's a lot of silver and copper coinage dumped there. So the Japanese, after they invaded, they uh, interrogating prisoners, they found out that this had happened. So they had some Filipino divers start doing deep sea recovery. Well, they were not experienced deep sea diving and they were dying from the bends as a result of that. So then the Japanese started forcing US Navy um, prisoners of war to do the deep sea recovery. And it's an interesting story about how the, those divers sabotaged quite a bit of the recovery efforts and were able to smuggle uh, a significant number of the uh, uh, retrieved coinage to the Philippines. And these metals, you know, you can buy the gold, silver, and copper, but you can also pick up silver and copper versions that have been sea salvaged. And those were ones that either were recovered by the Japanese or after World War II, the United States government went back and they were, I believe the Japanese recovered about 20% of the coinage 
the United States government was able to recover about 80% of it, but of the entire amount that was recovered. So you do see a lot of these metals that were uh, sea, were sea salvaged, damaged from being at the bottom of the, uh, the Manila Bay in the silver and copper versions. So I mentioned that Bill Hyder and I have written several other books. One of the books we wrote, we wrote was uh, Discover the World of Charbonneau's So-Called Dollars. And there's an interesting individual by the name of Jules Charbonneau that uh, attended quite a few of these expositions in 1904, uh, Lewis and Clark Exposition, the 1905 St. Louis Exposition, the 1939-1940 Golden Gate International Exposition and others. And at many of these expositions, he struck metals that he sold as souvenirs there. So we, uh, uh, Bill Hyder, uh, did a primary, quite a bit of the research, and we ended up writing a book on this individual and the things that he did. And that was the first book we wrote. We printed a thousand of those, and they, uh, they're all out of print. And that book did win an award from TAMS and the Numismatic Literary Guild as the best book of the year on metals and tokens as did uh, all the books we've written so far. So this is uh, one of about 15 different medals that he struck for the Golden Gate Internet International Exposition as the bust of Pacifica, which was uh, the main icon associated with that exposition. And this is the first medal that they struck out of 1D. It had 10K and then solid gold. And the 1D represented $1. And it was struck in 10K, even though it says solid gold. At that time, the term solid gold was often used for uh, 10 or 12 or 14K gold composition metals. Uh, they actually struck about 15 different varieties because they had issues with uh, issuing gold coinage and uh, the, the treasury department would not allow them to do that. So they actually changed the design from time to time. Uh, to, uh, so they were able to continue to issue these gold coins at that exposition, but um, there was about 15 different varieties of these metals. And as a collector, I was trying to kind of figure out what was going on. So Bill Hyder and I were able to chronologically figure why the different varieties evolved and how they evolved. And that's part of the story that we tell in that book. So here is uh, the exposition grounds for the uh, California Midwinter Exposition as held in 1894. There were three expositions that were held in San Francisco. This is the first. It was immediately following the um, Columbia Exposition, was, which was held in Chicago in 1893. Michael DeYoung was a vice president involved with helping put on the exposition in Chicago. He's also the publisher of the, uh, San, I believe it's the San Francisco Chronicle. And after the exposition was held in Chicago, he came back and convinced the citizens of San Francisco that they should host a similar event in San Francisco, which they did. This event was held on the, um, in the uh, Golden Gate Park. And if you've had an opportunity to go there, in Golden Gate Park, there's an area where the, the Japanese tea garden is, and that was one of the attractions at this exposition. The Michael de Young Museum is there. That building has been actually rebuilt several times since the exposition, but that is the immediate area of the fairgrounds, and there's a sunken area there in the center, and the tower here was in the center of that sunken area, and the buildings, the left is the administration building, and these are some of the buildings that were there. In 1915, the Panama Pacific International Exposition was held in the Marina District. In 1939 and 1940, after the completion of the Golden Gate Bridge and the Bay Bridge, uh, the citizens of San Francisco wanted to have a reason to invite everybody to come to San Francisco since those bridges were now completed and now it was much more convenient to get there. That's why the Golden Gate International Exposition was held in 1939-1940. This is the electric light tower, which is the one of the central devices there. And it had three levels, and there are actually restaurants at each one of those levels. You could go up an elevator in the middle and, and eat at them. At the very top, they had a search beam 
that would light up areas of San Francisco so bright that you could actually read a newspaper if you were there. Um, that's how bright and powerful that beam was. So these are some of the attractions that were at that exposition. And each one of these expositions, um, the, you know, they had lots of exhibits, often from uh, exhibitors from all over the world uh, on the latest technologies or advancements in, in uh, their country or the various countries that were participating. But each one of these expositions also had a midway or a game area. Um, so the, uh, and this is just an example of, of some of the um, attractions that were in the midway at the California, at, in the midway at the Midwinter Exposition. Um, the ball of gold on the right represented all the gold that had been mined in California since the discovery of gold. Uh, Dante's Infernal up above was um, an exhibit that, it, that gave you a, 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 let you know what the afterlife was going to be if you did not leave a, a, a healthy representative quality life. The gum girls down below were considered controversial because they were unescorted. They had what were considered at that time risque outfits and they would go around the exposition selling gum. So uh, here's the official medal from the 1894 California Midwinter Exposition that was struck by United States Mint. Uh, the dies were engraved by United States Mint. This medal was struck at that exposition and sold there as a souvenir. Uh, on the first day of the exposition, Gold-plated examples were sold. Um, after that, they sold an oreide or a brassy type material. It's also known and struck in a, a few other compositions. This is eight. This medal is Dickinson's Continental Dollar. This is struck in 1861. Montreville Dickinson is a fairly famous numismatist. He published a book in, in, in that era on uh, coin collecting, which is considered one of the first standard um, encyclopedias for collecting US coinage. Uh, originally, this medal was thought to have been engraved and sold as a souvenir for the 1876 Centennial Exposition. And um, actually, I was contacted by Q. David Bowers, who is a good friend of mine, and he was asking me. He's writing a, a, a book on that time at, on the uh, continental dollar. And he's asking me, what was the reference for this metal having been sold as a souvenir in 1876? And I said, well, I really was just kind of repeating what I had previously heard and I will look into it. Well, as it turned out, Bill Hyder ended up doing quite a bit of research on that subject afterward found that Montreal Dickinson had this medal engraved in 1861 and was sold along with a number of other medals by him at that time. Um, it may or may not have been sold at the Centennial Exposition in 1876. Uh, I think I'll get into some other Dickinson medals in a minute. Oh yeah, <clears throat> so what's interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, about the Montreal Dickinson medals so there are quite a few different metals that feature the continental dollar design on them. Most of them are, you know, I've seen probably 50 or more and they're relatively inexpensive. You can pick them up for a few dollars, maybe $5 a piece. But the metals struck by Montreal Dickinson are very popular with collectors today. Not only is the design very interesting having been struck in 1861, but those dies fell into the hands of a number of prominent numismatists over the years including um, Thomas Elder, who probably most of you are very familiar with. This is a medal that was actually struck by Thomas Elder in 1917. He acquired uh, Dickinson's dyes, quite a few of them. And the Continental Dollar, he, never, he never actually used the obverse and the reverse die to restrike exact copies of them. But in this case, is an example of where he used the obverse die of the Continental Dollar and mulled it with a um, a different uh, reverse die and uh, sold these metals as souvenirs uh, in 1917. 
And after Thomas Elder had those dyes, um, Hugh David Bowers also acquired them in 1961. He struck white metal examples of uh, the Dickinson with Dickinson's dyes. And here's a flyer that was produced by Empire Coin Company, um, which was a company owned by Hugh David Bowers at that time. And here's the uh, little envelope that they were uh, distributed in. And um, shortly after that, um, uh, Bachelow acquired the dyes. Bachelow is an individual who actually struck a number of different restrikes with dyes in the early 1960s. And this is a striking by, by Bachelow in silver. And on the reverse, at about six o'clock, there's a little S and that stands for silver. So Dickinson struck these metals using, um, I mean, excuse me, Bachelow struck these metals using Dickinson's dyes uh, in silver gold dyne. This is a gold dyne example and in bronze. And these are some of the envelopes that these metals were issued in and the number struck 2,000 in silver and 3,000 in gold dime. Here's a medal, another medal from the 1894 California Midwinter Exposition. Uh, there's about 20 to 30 different medals that were struck for that exposition. And this has, uh, on the obverse, it has the fairgrounds, which is a fairly accurate representation of how those buildings were structured at that time. On the left, there's a crag with a grizzly bear overlooking it. So um, exposition view or view dollars were a popular ways to kind of share with uh, people that were attending the expositions what these grounds looked like. And metal was all, excuse me, <clears throat> aluminum was a very popular and sexy metal to use at that time because uh, in the 18, early, or mid 1800s, aluminum was very expensive. But with the discovery of electricity, um, aluminum was able to be made very inexpensively. So aluminum changed from a metal that was more expensive than gold to much less expensive uh, in the late 1800s. So a lot of the metals from these expositions in that era were struck in aluminum, as well as other compositions. So here's another metal that I, I, I I like, I, I'm actually fascinated by, by Thomas Elder. There's a book written by Tom Delory that catalogs all of Elder's medals. There's well over a hundred different medals that Elder struck. And this is a medal he struck in 1908. This is a so-called dollar. Thrice defeated, what will the great commoner do? And this is uh, referring to William Jennings Bryan who ran unsuccessfully for the presidency three times in 1896. 1900 and again in 1908. And um, so uh, William Jennings Bryan was the uh, editor of a, of a publication called The Commoner. So this is just a, a medal engraved by, uh, struck by, or not engraved by, but struck by, that Thomas Elder had struck, uh, being a satirical making fun of uh, William Jennings Bryan after he lost for the third time running for the presidency. Uh, here's some uh, flyers for the 1915 Panama Pacific International Exposition. And uh, as I mentioned, that was held in the Marina District. And here's a, a aerial view of uh, the exposition grounds. Uh, for these expositions, as you can see, there's probably, you know, 20, 30, 40 different buildings that were built for this exposition. And most of those buildings were built of a temporary structure. They were like built out of uh, plast, um, uh, I can't think of the materials, but materials that were really not meant to last. <clears throat> so, there are large, beautiful, amazing structures, but um, they, they would deteriorate after a period of time, except for the uh, 
buildings that were intended to house the art, art artifacts often from uh, throughout the world. Those buildings for insurance purposes couldn't be housed in temporary structures. So most of these expositions would build some permanent structures, which are normally the art buildings that if any building still survived, those are the ones that have survived to date. And uh, the, the art building for the um, Panama Pacific International Exposition is now uh, being used in San Francisco as the Exploratorium. And uh, here's uh, these, this structure still stands in San Francisco. This was built for the 1915 Panama Pacific International Exposition. And this is the official medal from that exposition. That was, this medal is engraved by Robert Aiken and struck by United States Mint. <clears throat> uh, it represents um, mer mercury on the obverse, opening up the gates of the Panama Canal through which is sailing the ship Argo, which represents navigation. On the reverse, uh, the two females, which are modeled by Audrey Munson, represents the, uh, the east and the west being united by the opening of the Panama Canal. This is a silver version. It was also struck in different compositions. This is also struck gold-plated. This metal was not listed as gold-plated by Hibbler and Kappen. And here's a flyer that talks about the metal that was issued. Now, Robert Aiken uh, designed two of the commemorative coins that were sold for that exposition. Uh, the United States Mint struck five coins a silver half dollar, a gold dollar, a gold two and a half dollar, and two gold $50 coins around an octagonal. The round and octagonal gold coins were engraved by Robert Aiken, who engraved the official medal. And as a collector, I knew that there were different varieties of the bronze medals, so I would buy them and um, I would never sell them until, uh, and, and then about, you know, I, after maybe collecting these for well over 20 years, a good friend of mine, the coin dealer in the Northwest, um, Michael Sanders, showed me this, this flyer, an advertisement that he had seen that was advertising the medals for sale. And I thought it was very interesting, but he said, well, take a look at the center section there, which I have enlarged on the right. And that's where it identifies the different medals that were sold at the exposition. It mentions the bronze was sold as a bright bronze, an oxidized bronze, an antique bronze, and a statuary bronze, along with the gold plated and the silver ones. So that's when I, that, when that's when the light went on, I realized, okay, so that's the different varieties of these metals, which I knew existed, but I really couldn't figure out, I didn't really know for sure what was going on. So after that, Bill Hyder and I got together and we went through my collection of metals and sorted them and they fell into those four different categories. So prior to that, it was believed that just a bronze version was minted and most of the grading companies and oh, well, the grading companies and auction firms were you know, just using those as their standard reference. But now you'll see that since the publication of our book and several articles that we've written on this topic, you're starting to see the, uh, the adaptation of the different compositions that the bronze and metals are struck on being on the, uh, on the catalogs as the metals are certified or being offered for sale and auction. There's another interesting so-called dollar. This is a Bryan dollar. I mentioned William Jennings Bryan briefly a few minutes ago. This is a satirical metal. The uh, cartwheel in the center represents the size of a silver Morgan dollar, 38 millimeters. And that's how si the size of a Morgan dollar or peace dollar. The total size represents how large a silver dollar would have to be if it had a dollar's worth of silver in it. Now, William Jennings Bryan was running on the silver platform for the free coinage of silver because he felt that uh, the silver coinage, you know, prior, sometime prior to that, a, a silver dime or silver quarter or half dollar had that amount of silver in it. Well, that was no longer the case in the late 1800s. 
as the silver dollar only had 47 cents worth of silver in it. So he was running on the platform for the free coinage of silver to try to rectify what he felt was uh, an issue with that. So this is a piece that was struck in silver, uh, satirical, making fun of William Jennings Bryan's kind of, how would you like to carry a silver dollar in your pocket that was that large? And um, here's just, uh, William Jennings Bryan was actually controlled the Democratic Party for about the 12 years, those 12 years. And this is just some cartoons associated with this famous cross of gold speech at the 1896 Democratic National Convention. There's another interesting so-called dollar. This is struck in 1876 for the Centennial Exposition. And uh, there's probably over 100 medals that are struck for that exposition. This was... Uh, this is called the Lovett Battle Series. And um, this was engraved by George H. Lovett. And in, 18, in 1776, uh, George Washington fought more than eight battles, but, but um, Lovett decided to engrave medals commemorating eight different battles that George Washington fought in 1776, some of which he won and some of which he was not successful at. And they're numbered one through eight. These medals were struck in silver, copper, bronze, white metal. Oh, excuse me, yeah, there's silver, bronze, silver, bronze, white metal, and a bronze white metal. And uh, the white metal is the most common variety. There's probably about, 15 or 20 of these that have been certified in white metal by the various grading companies. And part of why these metals are so interesting to collect is I um, have, as, as a result of collecting and owning these metals in my collection, and there's eight of them, this one is from the Battle of Trenton, which is fought, fought on December 26 and 1776. I've taken the time to research uh, what happened to each one of these battles and my respect for George Washington has just grown immensely because of the amazing things that he was able to accomplish during that period of time. So the Battle of Trenton it took place on December 26th. Uh, George Washington crossed the Delaware River. Uh, there's actually a, a famous painting uh, depicting that. I don't know if I have it. Yeah, here it is depicted here. And so basically what I want to just kind of, without going into a whole lot of details, just talk about the fact that each one of these medals, as I mentioned, has a story to tell. And if people that collect them, when you hold that medal in your hand and you start to think about what happened at that, you know, what happened in, in at that, that time in New Jersey on December 26th and 1776, those medals become so much more significant to you and you appreciate them so much more. There's another couple of some more medals, um, so-called dollars. Uh, this is from the 1905 Lewis and Clark Exposition. Uh, this medal uh, is cataloged. At, it, it, it was, well, let's see, what do I want to say about it? It's conjoined busts. Now in Hitler and Kappen, they actually have four different medals with conjoined busts on them. And Bill Hyder and I have cataloged 18 different medals that um, have that, you know, different, different designs, conjoined busts of Lewis and Clark on them. This medal was struck by Joseph Mayer and Brothers of Seattle. And uh, here's another popular medal, so-called dollar. This is from the 1893 Columbian Exposition. The obverse was engraved by Charles by St. Gaudens. The reverse was engraved by Charles Barber. And there are a couple of different varieties of different this, this, of this metal that are cataloged by Bill Hyder and myself in our book. There's another metal that I find quite interesting. This is engraved. This was engraved by William Barber. This metal was struck in 1878 by United States Mint. There are modern restrikes that were also struck by the mint after that. 
and it's originally struck in silver and in bronze. This is one of what, one of what I call one of the three silver kings of so-called dollars. Uh, this medal is struck in silver which features George Washington. There's another silver medal that features Ulysses S. Grant, another medal in silver that features Roosevelt. And I consider those the three kings of silver so-called dollars. This medal was engraved for the 1909 Alaskan Yukon Pacific Exposition by George Morgan. There are different varieties of this medal. This is a gold plated variety. And in um, one of our books that Bill Hyde and I wrote, I acquired the dies that were used to strike this medal. And in the deluxe edition in our, of our books, I include a medal embedded into the cover. And I chose this metal design to embed it in the cover of our book. My medals are, are engraved, or engraved, not engraved, but are struck by Daniel Carr, a rather famous mentor. And the reverse, I had him create a die that was commemorating the release of our book. There's another popular medal. This is the 1892 Wells Fargo Centennial Medal. This is, this is, um, Wells Fargo had been in business for 50 years or 100 years at that, no, 50 years, I believe, at that. Oh, no, excuse me. Um, yeah, this is struck in 1902 by Wells Fargo. Nobody knows who actually engraved or struck this medal. And it was given to every employee of Wells Fargo who had worked for that company for at least one year at that time. Uh, here's another interesting medal. This is struck in gold for the 1905 Oregon Centennial Exposition. It features Eisenhower on it. This is also struck in a number of different compositions. As a standard reverse, there's about a half a dozen different obverse designs with this reverse for uh, the 1959 Centennial Exposition or Exposition held there. Oh, here's the uh, the um, Ulysses S. Grant medal is struck in 1869. It's also struck by the United States Mint. It was engraved by William Barber. It was struck for the completion of the uh, Transcontinental Railway, um, which was completed May 10th, 1869. And that concludes my presentation. Does anybody have any questions or anything they'd like to add? Excellent, thank you, Jeff. That was, uh, that was excellent. A nice uh, introduction to so-called dollars. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat. So if anyone does wanna ask, you're more than welcome to unmute and ask, or if you wanna put it in the chat, I'm more than happy to, um, to, to ask for you. Uh, one, one of my favorite so-called dollars is comes from the 1894 Midwinter Expo, and you didn't show it, but it has the Firth wheel on it. Uh, yeah. so the Ferris wheel, quite famously, was introduced at the 1893 uh, Columbian Expo, and when they brought the idea back to San Francisco, uh, a gentleman with this surname Firth. Uh, created the Firth wheel instead of the Ferris wheel. And I've actually seen um, uh, descriptions of the metal claiming that the inscription Firth wheel is an error and it's supposed to say Ferris wheel because we all know it as a Ferris wheel now, but um, uh, you know, at the time, uh, each of these giant wheel rides were uh, had the names of the creators. So I just thought that that was pretty interesting that the sometimes people try and correct the Firth wheel, uh, so-called dollar, when it is in fact the Firth wheel. Right. Yeah, I've heard that before too. Yeah. Uh, but it, yeah, you, it is it is accurate calling a Firth wheel. At that time, those rides were not known as Ferris wheels. That's a term that evolved later on. So uh, Ferris did create the first one, and Firth created the one that was used in San Francisco. It was a much smaller version, much much smaller version than of the Ferris wheel that was at the than that. That was at the Columbian Exposition. I have a question. This is Ken Edlow. Um, I enjoyed your presentation. I have your book. Uh, I'm wondering, I think you indicated that you're going to distribute something that attaches a value to 
metals, and I, let me follow up. And if you are, um, I presume it, it ties very much into the, how rare they are and the condition, because I would imagine you follow up that these metals aren't worn particularly like coins would be. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure, Kenneth. Um, first of all, yes, uh, for my the previous book to this book that we just published was so-called Dollars from the Pacific Coast Expositions. As I mentioned, there are eight expositions that were cataloged in that book and probably a several hundred medals. And so shortly after that book was produced, I came out with a, what I call a pocket guide, which uh -huh. is a small book. It's made about four inches wide, about six inches tall. You can actually fit it in your, your, in your coat pocket. It has photos of all the metals that were published in that book, the different compositions that were struck in, and values in various grades from extra fine to MS65. So mm -hmm. when Bill and I write our books, we do not put values in them because as you all know, those values soon become obsolete. So instead what we do is we publish this pocket price guide, which will be updated periodically with the same values. So our current book, which has uh, probably six or seven or 800 medals in it. Once that book is sold out, probably towards the end of this year, I'll be coming out with an updated version of our pocket price guide, which will have photos of all the medals in that book and their values and various grades. Okay, so I'm, I hope you'll let us know when it's available, so. Oh, I sure will. Now, as far as circulated, Truthfully, many of these metals are fairly well circulated because they were in pocket pieces. People would buy them and put them in their pockets because this is, many of these expositions were held before photography was in the state it is today. So like at the Columbia Exposition or the Midwinter Exposition, there were professional photographers that are taking pictures, but the general public did not have phone cameras. They would buy these medals as souvenirs to take them back to show the people. I went in this, there might be a building on the medal, a picture of a building or a person or the fairgrounds. They'd take these medals back to their family and their friends and say, I went in this building. This is what the fairgrounds look like. I saw this person there, this famous person or wherever the case may be. So a lot of these medals are fairly well circulated. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, Ken. Any other questions? Jeff, I have another question. And uh, I only actually came across this uh, group of metals only coincidentally a handful of days ago. Uh, so I, I want to ask your question, uh, your opinion on uh, what do you think about so called half dollars? And where uh, do you plan on writing a book on them in the future? Yeah, so it's called a half dollars in another category for several of these metals. They're, they're smaller than 32 millimeters, so 32 millimeters is smaller. Um, I have no intention of writing a book on them. I think they're interesting and fascinating, but I do not collect them. I have heard of a couple different individuals who have told me that they were going to write a book on so called half dollars. But it was a long time ago, and I haven't heard anything in a long time. So I'm not aware of anybody who's actually currently working on any reference to the gold medal. Got it. And I do not intend to write one. Um, I've, I've got a lot of other, so I write a pretty book solid with the books we plan to write. So uh, that's not something that's even on our radar. Yeah, they, uh, they, they don't seem as fun as the, the so called dollars. So. They're not. They're cool. <laughs> not here. Definitely. Yeah, some uh, of the other books that Bill and I are writing is we're going to be coming out with a volume two. That's probably about another three to five years from now. Volume one, our latest book, covers all the so called dollars associated with a fair art exposition, which is about theory. But there are a lot of other historical medals that are struck that are not associated with an exposition, like the completion of the theory of the so all of those metals are cataloged in our volume two book. We're actually uh, a bit 
back right now because we decided to prioritize a coffee table book, which we are currently in the middle of work on. We, we have some work on volume two, but we're now shifting gears and, and coming out with a coffee table book that we're going to have to come out later this year. And Bill Hyder and I are going to be uh, co-authoring that along with Scott Safe, a new person that we've invited to uh, work with us on this subject. And we're also going to be writing a book on Thomas Elder. Tom Delory uh, is going to be on that effort. Tom Delory was a standard reference that was published in the 1980s. We're also going to be writing a book on Mark Nicholson and a number of other topics. Very good. We actually have a huge collection of elder medals here. So when you're on that project, let us know and we can uh, let you know what we have here as well. Oh, that'd be great. Thank yeah, you. definitely. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I see you can collect something myself. What, what was that again? I said I have a significant collection. You cut out for me on that one. I just said I have a Can you hear me? A uh, little bit. Okay. Well, um, I don't know what the problem is, but we're having some uh, uh, an audio issue. But I just said I also have a significant collection of L. Thomas Elder medals. Got it. Got it. I heard you that time. Yeah, we for the vast majority of uh, your presentation, we were able to hear you. There's just a little bit at the beginning, and then for whatever reason, now during questions. But but uh, overall, we you were good. Uh, I see that Bill Hyder is actually on the call, and uh, I don't know if you want to say hi or or any add anything along the way. I'll, I'll just say hi, and I'll make one note about Jeff and I's partnership. Um, it was a month after I retired. We got together. We talked about his projects and shook hands, and we've been partners based on a handshake for all these years now, and it's been very productive and led to a great friendship. That's excellent. Actually, I don't know if you remember, I met both of you at the same time, I think at the World's Fair show, uh, and we started talking about Mako um, and, and your guys' role in, in the Medallic Art Company, and that's kind of how all this snowballed into today. But, uh, and one of the things that you gave me, Jeff, is, is your business card, which is in fact a so-called <laughs> dollar. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. And, and, and to see, Bill, good to see you. Indeed, yes.